Welcome to the Business of Medicine podcast from the Southern Medical Association. Since 1906, SMA has had a singular mission to provide medical professionals with the resources they need to learn from each other and in doing so, improve the overall quality of patient care. The Business of Medicine podcast is dedicated to exploring and simplifying the varied and complex business aspects of running a medical practice so that you can do what you do best, provide your patients with the highest possible standard of care. To learn more about SMA's many other services and educational initiatives, please visit us at sma.org. Today we are joined by Mark Griffin, President and Founder of Blue Eagle Consulting, and Sherry Pouncey, Blue Eagle's Director of Operations. They will be discussing how to achieve successful electronic health record transition and implementation. Founded in 2004, Blue Eagle Consulting provides IT staffing and project consulting for enterprise-level software systems used by hospitals and health plans. Thank you both for being here. Well, Jennifer, thank you for having us on. We're, um, it's a pleasure to be on with SMA, and uh, we appreciate you having this opportunity to, to share some of our experiences with your physicians. Why is this topic important for others to know about? You know, the key, the key to all this, and, and we've seen many of them, uh, physician adoption is really, really critical. No surprise, but it's, it's super critical. And I guess what we see is that there's so much time and effort, uh, sometimes over a year, put into the software. The implementation, the features, the function, the training, um, there's just, there's such a ramp up to this, this go live date that what happens, and I think sometimes what people are not or maybe surprised that is it goes from a software access go live to a people issue really fast. Because uh, once that software goes live, you're looking at how well did you train your people? How well do they trust the system? And everything that you've done up to that, be, up to that point around training and coaching and mentoring becomes really important. So we've also seen that in, in another two areas, like internal super users, everybody, everybody uses them. The, these things can become a two-edged sword. Um, are you gonna use your super users uh, to augment the ATE support or do you really have super users that can go out and, and, and just be super users among, among your group? Um, we've seen both sides of that and Sherry can help with the firsthand experience on that later. The other is um, that can go either way is virtual training. It, there's no question that today, especially coming out of COVID, it wasn't even an option. You had to do it. Um, and we've seen, we've seen clients that have done it well, and, and we've seen some that, you know, it didn't turn out that well. And there's ways to avoid that. And, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. And Sherry can touch on those. What is most unknown about this topic? Well, I touched on it earlier. Uh, it really is a people adoption issue. That's, that's the key of the whole thing. It's not just, you know, how do you access software feature functions? Um, you know, workflow and navigation are not completely intuitive and self-guiding. And as much, and wonderful, as much training as you can put into this and as much as the software is, the systems are really very comprehensive. Um, you're gonna to have to get to that point where are your people willing to adopt it or not? Um, planning and, and I guess being very honest about how well you've trained them and what's the, the mindset or what's the capabilities of your people become really important. The other thing that happens, um, it's the 20, 80, 20 rule. I think everybody is gonna end up dealing with that. Um, and that means 20% of the people are going to be utopic. They're going to adopt it and just love it. They just think it's great. 80% um, in the middle, 60, 80% are like, you know, it is what it is. I mean, I'll get along with it. Um, they're kind of indifferent, but, but they will cooperate and, and they're fairly fine. And then you're going to have 20%. Um, it's tough. Uh, they either just don't want to accept it or they see it as an obstacle. So you kind of have to think through um, what are you going to do with that 20%? And can you use your 20% that are super users and really excited? Are there things that you can do to, to help get that 20% that, that are not over the hump? Um, Sherry will talk about some specifics on that later, but, but it's really, a, it, it's, 
as I said earlier, um, you're going to get 20, 80, 20, and you're going to have to be prepared to deal with it. What is the best way to staff a training and implementation team? Well, this is where I'm going to turn it over to Sherry. Um, there, the answer is there's no singular cookie cutter best way to tell you the truth. There are some common principles, uh, but in the end, it, it's really about self-assessment of your organization, your vendor, and where you're, where you're headed and adapting your organization to the people that, that you have. And I think Sherry, you can, you can give some specifics uh, about how that happens. Yes, thank you, Mark. And thank you for having us, Jennifer. We're um, excited to be part of uh, today's podcast. So really when you're talking about a training program and how you're gonna lead up to this D-Day of implementation, when this go live is gonna happen, it's how do you assess your own staff? How big is your education department? How are you gonna be able to utilize them? Do you need augmented resources for training and for implementation? Anytime that you can have a specialist training a specialist, you are in much better shape, in particular when you're talking about providers. Providers like to know and they can tell very quickly if the person teaching them or leading their training session knows what they're talking about. And what I mean by that is if you can have another clinician leading the classroom training or the virtual training for that matter, they pick up on that right away. It's so important to choose the right trainer for um, in particular provider training because you need to be able to get across to that provider, not just where the click needs to happen, but why that click is going on. So anytime that you can have um, boots on the ground people that they already know that work at those facilities that are uh, either from the education department or maybe there's a provider liaison team uh, that lots of um, healthcare organizations utilize. Uh, those familiar faces, at least in the classroom, even if they are not the classroom trainer, uh, oftentimes really does facilitate much more um, engaging uh, classroom activity. The other thing that you have to do is, is when you are choosing that training staff, those people have to be vetted. Not only do they need to know the software, the ins and outs of that software, but they also need to know the specific workflows for whatever they would be training. Someone may be very well suited to train a cardiology class, but not so well suited to uh, train the class where the workflow needs to be specific to surgeons, for instance. So picking those trainers are very important. Having those trainers do teach backs before training ever begins to see actually their interaction and the way they would lead and command a classroom is very important. Not only do you see how well they actually know the software or know that system or know those specific workflows that might be very specific to a site, a facility, or to a group of providers, but you see how well they interact in a leadership role where sometimes we have to manage uh, big personalities and we have to manage uh, little one-off conversations and things that, that oftentimes happen in provider classrooms that may not necessarily happen in um, other types of um, classrooms on a um, healthcare campus. So those are some very important things. Uh, the, the person also needs to know all the little tips and the tricks, how that surgeon is gonna easily navigate the system, something that might not necessarily be in the curriculum that might be very important to the workflow of a, of a specific provider um, organization. And the other thing I'll say about training is how are you gonna use those super users? And I know Mark touched on this just a minute ago, but when you start out to, to plan a super user program, it really has to be very intentional and very well planned. To me, a super user is often misused in healthcare organizations. They pull people, quote unquote, out of the numbers, meaning if it's a nurse, they're not gonna take patients during go live, they're gonna be available to help their peers. But to be a true super user, you need to know more workflow than just your workflow. You need to be able to help that unit secretary on your unit, as well as that 
hospitalist who's been around on your unit. So super user training needs to be very intentional and very thought out and very thorough so that these folks, when go live is over, truly become the extension of all of those resources that you pile in a hospital for a two week period uh, called at the elbow support uh, who can help in any area of, of a hospital. Your super users are, are going to be your boots on the ground support uh, before, during, and after any go live actually happens. So that part is very important. It's often misunderstood and it's often overlooked in healthcare organizations when these implementations happen. Now that you've explained how that component falls into place, how do you make a virtual training program work? Well, as Mark said, virtual training kind of became something that we had to do this last year. And I've been involved in multiple, multiple virtual training programs even before they were quote unquote mandatory. So you kind of have to know who your group is. You have to have standards for what type of um, IT equipment they're gonna um, have to have to attend these training sessions. Will they be attending from their office? Will they be attending from home? Uh, you have to deal with distractions in the home and those type things. But all of the issues that come with virtual training, horror stories that we've heard about over this last year in particular of, of how trainings didn't go well, all of those issues can really be mitigated by having a really strong virtual training plan uh, for things as simple as having a proctor that gets on the call, you know, 30 minutes before the actual class training starts to make sure no one has connectivity issues, making sure everyone has um, the access that they need so that training can start on time and be beneficial for all the participants. Those are things that can easily be uh, mitigated to help that, um, those things from happening. You also need someone to manage that chat. If you've got a classroom full of 20 providers and you are utilizing, let, we'll just say the WebEx platform uh, for uh, training, then those doctors can post questions in the chat. Well, the classroom trainer can't necessarily manage that while she's training the class. So having someone to keep up with that and, and keep things moving uh, to be able to interrupt that instructor when, the, when it's appropriate, those are all very important things to keep things moving and for the participants to be heard when they need to be heard. Uh, it's my personal preference when you're training a group of providers not to use any of those adjuncts to the, the training platform and let it just be more of a, um, I'll say free for all. I really don't mean uh, just speak at will, but for that interaction to actually happen. So not wait till a certain point to ask the question or type the question and wait on it to be heard, but for them to be able to uh, engage the instructor as you're moving forward in the training session, really to me, in my opinion, brings a lot of value, not just to the person asking the question, but to someone else also on the call that probably has the, um, the same question. The other way to really um, make the virtual training much more beneficial is for practices and or groups of friends or um, partners within a health system to take the training together. Uh, it's always better when you have someone that you can text a question, you know, on, on the fly. Did she just say that? Or did I miss that? Or what about this? Those are things, and also when the training is over, for you to have someone that, that you know, that you work with, that you can discuss things with. It just makes it much more meaningful, and it also makes the participants a little bit more at ease when they know other people that are in the class. So I find that to be a very valuable uh, practice as well to try to group those, those people together. And I guess the last thing I would say about virtual training is just to make sure that all of your participants in the class feel comfortable. If they feel comfortable and they know they can interrupt you and they know that they can ask questions and that it's an environment where uh, it's not just something we have to do or I have to log on and I have to click this and watch it for two hours. Uh, it, if, if we can engage them and have them comfortable, the class is going to be much more meaningful. Hey, Sherry, um, I, I 
Would it be safe to say that our experiences has seen that in virtual training, there's probably two extremes. It's either gone very well or, or not well at all. It, it tends not to be mediocre. It, it tends to be one or the other. That's probably fair. I, I feel like um, I certainly have been involved in more that have gone very, very well than, than the ones that were disasters. But I've certainly heard the disaster stories and I think we've got a um, very good bag of tricks to uh, keep us going in that right direction of how we can make virtual training very meaningful. You touched on what things that can go wrong. And as we're, we've all learned, especially this past year, you know, of doing meetings from home and things. What are some of the things that might have happened that made training maybe less ideal? Because you, like you said, you know, the successes you don't always hear about as often, but sometimes you hear, oh, this didn't exactly go as smoothly. Are there certain things that, that sometimes technology not work properly or are people distracted because they're not in their usual environment? Is it just kind of the things that we might all be experiencing from working in more of a telecommuting environment? Yes, Jennifer, I think that is exactly it. Uh, technology is probably number one. Uh, and then a, a close second would be those external distractions, whether or not it's uh, a dog barking or uh, children in the background, those kinds of things. So we, when we're at home, we sometimes have more demands on us than if we're you know, sitting in our office with our door closed, uh, like I am now. So um, those are, you're absolutely right. A lot of that can be mitigated. Some of it though, you just have to take a quick pause. And one of the things I have always said, um, I started uh, years ago as a classroom trainer for providers. And one of the first things I always say is, you know, I, I realize you guys are all very busy. And if your phone goes off and you need to answer it, just kind of raise your hand. Let me know you're going to be texting. Let me know you're going to have to step out. We'll just all take a break right then so that we can all stay together and we can all stay on task and we can, um, you know, get through the class together and everyone gets out of it what they need. So as long as you start the, the class with that open communication that, you know, if something happens and, hey, you've got to go let the dog out or let the dog in, uh, you know, it, we want everyone to end up with um, this certain level of expectation once the class is over where we hope their, their educational level is with, with whatever this topic is. So um, those communications can help mitigate a lot of those external forces. And having that extra person on the line to help mitigate those technology issues is, is something that I, I just wouldn't do a virtual class without having that support system because one person can't manage the classroom and manage all of those issues. How do you bridge the gaps that are found once the adoption has taken place? You know, one of the things that we've learned from clients afterwards, and, and we had an example recently where one of the physician champions who was very active, uh, not only in promoting, you know, the training going up to, but would literally walk the floor and ask other doctors about how's it going. And he admitted that um, he wished he could be a duplicate of himself because he knew that as a physician, he was being very effective at not only getting their attention, but helping them. The, the challenge becomes is you can't take 10 or 20 physicians, you know, out of your, <laughs> out of your hospital and do that. But, but there's a lot to be said for either a specialist or nurse or anybody that's a provider um, that just has immediate credibility, who's willing to do something other than just, you know, do their job every day and walk around and Go to, the, go to the lunchroom. He said, I would go to the lunchroom. And I would say, guys, how's it going? And he said, we had some of the best conversations either on the floor, um, in the lunchroom, or walking down the hall. And uh, they can be very, very effective, not only in helping people get through things, but listening to what's going on, what's going on in your department, and then giving it back to people that are running the training and the implementation. Yeah, and I would add to that, Mark, that you can't wait to go live for this to happen. We really have to promote the physician readiness months before this go live ever happens. You know, we talk about the implementation and how well this software is gonna work and how it's gonna innovate this or innovate that or totally reinvent some workflow. And it's just gonna be so much better. 
we really have to promote that buy-in from those providers. We need to use physician champions, and that's exactly what Mark was just talking about. Those physician champions could be folks who are right out of medical school that use this new software that we're about to migrate to. They used it in medical school or they used it in residency and, and they can get on the bandwagon with us and they can try to help promote it. We might do things like a cheerleading booth in the um, common areas of the hospital where you've got providers who might come spend an hour of their, of their day to talk to other providers to try to encourage excitement for what this new transition is about to be. Um, also things like road shows or trunk shows sometimes they're called where you get these, these physician champions to go from provider practice to provider practice and pass out information and sign people up for favorites fairs and sign people up for classroom training, things to really promote excitement. Those are very important. And then also we've got to think back to what we talked about super users. You've got to have a strategy for super users. You know, oftentimes we bring in all these go live support at the elbow support folks and you bring in all these training people, but these super users, they're going to be people that the providers already know and already trust. They're going to be able to uh, promote that buy-in better than any IT staff person or even someone on the hospital's education team ever could. It's kind of got to be a, you know, rah-rah cheerleader type thing to a certain extent, but what we really need is for those physician champions to be able to communicate to the other providers how this is going to make things better for you if you put in the work to learn it. And I have a quote that really stood out to me. If there was like one little sound bite from the podcast, I heard this quote from a chief medical informatics officer and I wrote it down and I just thought it was fabulous. And I'm gonna quote him now. He says, using an existing electronic health record or implementing to a new platform will not make you automatically efficient or make you provide better patient care but that will happen with sufficient training and most importantly, sufficient learning. And we always talk about sufficient training. We talked earlier about the training program, but what it comes down to is you've got to have sufficient learning. If the folks aren't learning it, if the providers aren't learning it and we don't get them excited about it, it's not going to equate to better workflows and better patient care. And that's our bottom goal for implementing a new electronic medical record is better workflow and better patient care. Sherry, I think of one last thing there that, and you've been on the ground dealing with this as much as we talk about the need to really think hard and plan well. And it's, I mean, it's super important, but I think the other thing, uh, a mindset is you got to realize that that morning when this new system gets turned on, everything will change and you got to be willing to adapt and just just assume that you know things aren't going to go exactly the way you put them on a flow chart or you put it on a on a schedule you're just gonna it, it's people issues and um so having that mindset to really really prepare up front um and then just to realize you're going to have to adapt especially in that fir first uh three to five days you're going to find out a whole lot about how the training went and how your people are adapting to it. And uh, I know Sherry has um, Sherry's been hands-on uh, dealing with that in many, many occasions. Thanks that y'all provided um, this one bullet, the fact 60 to 80% of providers feel that their EHR is okay, 10 to 20% hate it. I was just curious because you hear sometimes, you know, that physicians, you know, we've, we've heard, well, I'm going to retire before I have to implement an EHR in my office or my practice. So it, it sounds like with the proper training and learning experience that this, this is a really good thing. It really is, Jennifer. I'll, I'll kind of answer that just a little bit because one of the things that you, those numbers are probably true. Um, and it's, it's a group of people sometimes that are always up for the newest, the latest, the greatest, you know, that person that gets in line for that new iPhone. Um, you know, they got to have the latest technology and, and oftentimes a software transition, they're going from something that's 
um, a little bit older, even though it is an electronic medical record, you know, they're going to get something newer and so they're excited about it. And then there are those people that, you know, just kind of go with the flow, whatever y'all tell me to do, I, you know, yes, I'll have to learn it. So I will learn it. And then those are the, the people that are kind of adverse to change. Maybe like you said, they're a little bit older. Uh, I've had folks in my classroom before, uh, providers that were older that, that literally said, I'm going to retire. They made me come to this class, but I'm retiring before I have to do that. And, and my response to them is always the same thing. You know, if you're ready to retire, that's one thing, but we are not going to let this medical record transition, you're not going to retire because of this. So, and once you, you know, spend a little bit of time with them and, and, and you become their, um, you know, their extra set of hands and, and ears and eyes, because you, you're not going to let them fail. They realize that, yeah, they can do it. So it, some of it is just the, the, they don't want to change. They're just adverse to change. And some of them are scared. They're, they've learned how to do it for so long. They feel like they're too old to learn a new way. Um, and then there are the people that are just like ornery, you know, that, that um, they just don't want to do it. And, and the, all those groups of people are, are included in those, uh, those numbers that, that Mark quoted a little bit ago. But the fact of the matter is, is that anybody can learn to do it. I mean, they're doctors, my goodness. So certainly they can learn to do it. And they got through medical school, they can learn just about anything. So um, you just have to, you have to figure out how you, to reach each person. And, you know, somebody that's done it a long time figures out a way to reach just about anybody that there is and, and takes it as a complete failure when they can't. So um, I'm speaking from personal experience. It's, um, you know, you just, you have to be able to find a way to reach them. That's why it's so important to hire the right trainers up front, because those right trainers will figure out a way to reach those people. Hey, Jennifer, another, another practical thought, and I guess to be fair to the physicians who, who react that way. I mean, think about it. Nobody likes change. Um, and that's just not, and, and the second piece of that is this is the most pervasive comprehensive change you could ever imagine in your profession. Every single thing they do is now computerized. Absolutely. <laughs> I, mean, Absolutely. I mean, it is massive, every single thing. And that, you know, it just, it gets into, as, as Sherry mentioned, well, how do you do, and these systems are very adaptable. You can set up the workflow, but it's not always set up right away. And they're, you know, they're asking them, well, how do you do your workflow? It's like, I don't have time to explain that. Set it up and turn it on. I'll figure it out later. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, they set it up, turn it on. They go, well, this is not coming up the way I do this. I'm like, well, but that's because you couldn't take the time to figure it out. It's, it's a, I think, honestly, in other industries, probably the same thing, you know, if you were implementing SAP in a, in a very large company, you know, a big manufacturer or something like that, you'd have the same issue. You're just, you're just getting into every single thing that a person does at work every day and telling them it's going to be computerized and, and that their life is going to get turned upside down. It's just, it's human nature, I think, you know, who wants to go through that? <laughs> Absolutely. And I think too, it's part of not necessarily what you're telling them, it, it's how you're telling them. And, and I think the way you convey this, and again, going back to that learning experience, I think sort of softens the blow, if you will. I mean, again, it's, it's something that is happening. Change is inevitable. Um, yeah. It's just how it's presented and how it's explained and just knowing as a physician, you're not alone in this. And i um, sure it's scary, but that's why you have somebody, the trainers here to help guide you through it and go through the process with you so in our business we call it a big lift and it is a big one <laughs> i like that that's a nice way to it, it to, is to, uh, it is in the world of big lifts this one is uh, catastrophic and atomic <laughs> that it, is a it's very big. big lift this has been a really interesting discussion and i i can really appreciate and have a whole new appreciation for the the learning component. It's one thing to train, but then to learn. So I really thank you both for, for spending some time with us today and really kind of delving into to this and what will lead to a successful implementation. So thank you both for, for sharing your insight today. Thank, thank you. Jennifer. We hope you enjoyed the business of medicine. For more episodes in this series or SMA's The Practice of Medicine podcast, 
go to sma.org forward slash podcasts or subscribe to us on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. For more information about SMA's mission, please visit us at sma.org. And thank you for joining us.